Thank you for joining us on Idaho State of Mind, where we endeavor to educate the citizens of Idaho on the state of higher education. I'm Libby Howe. This is a production of Idaho State University, and we are proud that the majority of the show's content is created by Idaho State University students. A university is not an island separated from the concerns of the rest of the world. Today, we will look at the ways Idaho State University is reaching out to the world around us, whether it be groundbreaking research health care to the underprivileged or rolling up their sleeves to lend a hand. We will introduce you to one ISU professor who is uncovering ancient ruins and saving the jungles of Guatemala. We will also look at how ISU is integrating service into its curriculum. This and much more is coming up later in the show. But first, most people don't think physics as being fun. Complicated, definitely. Interesting, maybe. But fun generally isn't your first thought. A group of Idaho State University students are working very hard to change that perception. And their efforts to make physics fun has gained them a national award. Idaho State of Mind's Ramon Bailey shows us how ISU is demystifying physics for local children. The Idaho State University Society of Physics Students, or SPS, has received an outstanding chapter award for the National Society of Physics Students and the American Physical Society. Dr. Steve Shropshire said outstanding SPS chapters are determined each academic year. Careful review of the information, photos, and supporting material presented in annual chapter reports determine which club will be awarded the title. There are um, about 200 chapters nationwide. so. These folks have come out in the top 10 uh, every year for the last couple of years. One of the award criteria requires clubs to get involved in community service and social events. The ISU SPS Club participates in many community events like the Haunted Lab, where it helps at the Halloween Carnival on the ISU campus. SPS was specifically recognized for its pumpkin chuck competition. They also conduct monthly demonstrations for the public to see what physics can and sometimes does consist of. These demonstrations have been put on YouTube and some have received over a thousand views. We mainly focus on outreach, which means that we help out, uh, show physics to the community and see, show how fun it is and that kids get involved and get interested in science. Every year, the club participates in Pi Day at the Pine Ridge Mall, where students put on demos of what fun physics can be. This program is geared towards children and includes a variety of different stations. One station involves two spheres that deal with static electricity and another made ice cream using liquid oxygen. There were also two stations that demonstrated magnets dealing with positive and negative fields. After completing the circuit, the two magnets inside are nearly impossible to pull apart. After disconnecting the circuit, it then makes the magnet easier to pull apart. The SPS Club hopes that these events, in which donations are accepted, will help the club continue to provide family, fun, and information for the community. At the Pine Ridge Mall, Ramon Bailey, Idaho State of Mind. One way ISU's physics club was able to make physics more accessible was by posting their highly entertaining demonstrations on YouTube. You can find a link to their YouTube demonstrations on our Idaho State of Mind website. Between 2000 and 2008, there was a slight decrease in English as a second language teachers in American schools. After receiving more than $95,000 in scholarship grants, Idaho State University is helping to change these numbers. The Grow Your Own School Scholarship is helping ISU's Department of Educational Foundations educate more teachers. And the grant is provided by the Idaho State Board of Education. Scholarship recipients must work in Idaho school districts. Fields like bilingual education and English as a second language are included in the program. And in the spring of 2010, researchers at Idaho State University began studying how climate change may affect elk populations. They compared elk in the mountainous forests of Oregon versus herds on the desert plains near the Idaho National Laboratory in eastern Idaho. Determine how the thermal environment, which is composed not just of temperature but also solar radiation and wind and things like that, everything that influences an animal's body temperature, uh, how that thermal environment influences behavior and energy balance of elk in the desert versus elk in the forest. 
Researchers placed GPS collars on female elk, then logged the elk's location hourly throughout the summer. Data revealed elk travel longer distances in the desert than in mountainous areas, with differences upwards of 25 miles per day. This is the first part of a three-year study. In coming years, researchers will use this data to see if climate change has had any long-term effects on elk. Imagine flying high in a hot air balloon or controlling a robot as it disarms a bomb. These are just a couple of careers that high school students can experience at the Tech Expo hosted by ISU's College of Technology. And the purpose behind the expo is for students to see the opportunities that are available to them here at the university, specifically the College of Technology and a few other departments, and then what other career opportunities might be available to them once they complete their education. It gives us more opportunity to learn about what the school has to offer us. The expo features 70 career opportunities from medical and health to military and engineering fields. Not only do students have the chance to get information about new fields, they also get to interact with each booth. That could be stapling an arm, doing push-ups for treats, or exploring the world of physics. This education fair provides a venue to showcase opportunities higher education can bring to the future of Idaho's high school students. Idaho State University is making a difference in local communities and nations far and wide. In some cases, the effect of ISU's work is so immense as to literally be changing the landscape of a nation. In other cases, it's as personal as improving the lives of just a handful of Idahoans. We start with First Year Seminar, an ISU class that actually requires students to do service. They learn that service not only benefits the community, but those who are serving as well. Idaho State of Mind's Chris Cole has more. Service learning is at Idaho State University, and students are finding out that service isn't just about volunteering your time. It's about volunteering your personality and positive attitude, and even getting on the floor and showing your awesome dance skills. One class participating in service learning went to Life, Inc., a group formed for cognitively impaired people who want to remain independent. Each semester, a group of students travels to Life, Inc., and they host a dance, students and participants together. Believe it or not, this is service learning. Students learned about this through the service learning program at ISU that is being implemented into specific classrooms. These students then perform a service learning project with equal weight on the learning before and the service after. All these service projects we've been able to do and learning about people with like disabilities I think has helped um, us and just like people as individuals become more involved with the community. Each ISU school year, service learning has a different theme for service, and for this past year, it was cognitive impairment. These range from Alzheimer's, autism, and any type of brain injury to dyslexia. The entire purpose behind the service learning program is to help students become active in their community, as well as learn about people in need. I've learned a lot and gotten to know people that I wouldn't, like, regularly probably get to know. Many students participating in the dance shared food, fun, and a love of music with participants in Life, Inc. By the end of the night, some students had even made arrangements to participate in the next dance, even if they aren't part of the class. Showing off my own air guitar skills, Chris Cole, Idaho State of Mind. Nice air guitar. First Year Seminar is not the only program at ISU to incorporate service learning into the curriculum. They join many upper-level business classes, and the program is always looking to expand into other classrooms. When disasters like the recent earthquakes in Haiti and Japan happen, Idaho State University rushes to help disaster victims. The ISU Japanese Club recently established a relief fund to help raise money. The group is a small club with big hearts, and even though they are small in numbers, they have managed to raise large amounts of money to help others out. The club raises money through donations and events such as Japanese Night. It's a pretty devastating earthquake. And so that was taken up quickly by the members of the Japanese club, and we decided to start raising money. Wonderful students. I have never seen such a, you know, teamwork. It's a, it's a solidarity. It's very great. I feel really proud to have students like that. The Japanese club plans on giving all the money raised to the Red Cross in Japan. Some students decide to travel a substantial distance just to lend a helping hand. ISU's Idaho Condors Humanitarian Club traveled to Peru to attend to the medically underserved. ISU photographer Susan Duncan prepared this report.
This is Bernadette Howlett. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Physician Assistant Studies at Idaho State University. So there's a student organization that got started on campus called Idaho Condor Club. And one of the students who was a member of the club was also my research assistant and started talking about wanting to go on this trip. Seeing the students' passion for what they were doing really sparked my interest, and so I ended up kind of joining in, following along. It's a really very student-driven sort of project, and I've never seen one like that before, and that was really interesting to me as a faculty member. Hi, my name is Kendall Johnson. I am the founder of the Idaho Condor Humanitarian Club at Idaho State University. My first expedition was with the organization two years ago. I saw a potential for students getting uh, international humanitarian experience from Idaho to Peru. We started the student organization to recruit more students so we could have pretty much more hands down there and performing the medical procedures that we were doing. And then my role basically down there was just to be a student volunteer and, and just help out where I could in the medical clinics. Hi, my name is Kate Erickson. I'm a senior dietetic student at Idaho State University. Last March 2010 was my first year going down to Peru with the Idaho Condors. We had about 37 students go with us on the trip. Professionals, we had a, a similar number for a total team amount of about 70 people or so. I had never been out of the country before, and going down, I guess, as a senior in nutrition, I thought I was going to have all this, these great things to teach them about food and nutrition. And, but really what I found was that they have so much to teach us and me. I learned so many things from them, just interacting with them, seeing how they get by with what we would perceive as not very much. I mean, people would walk miles and for hours from surrounding villages to come to the clinic. So word would go out by the time midday arrived, people would be coming in. And there would be people who, you know, had serious health problems and disabilities. People bent over with osteoporosis on crutches coming miles down the mountain to come in and get their health care. Well, the experience to me is, is truly life-changing. It's something that instilled in me a desire to do this type of work the rest of my life. Being able to help people, that's just an incredible feeling. And seeing the uh, relief that you can bring to people immediately and hopefully the long-term changes that we can, can do in, in Peru is going to be something that can draw strength on the rest of your life. The Idaho Condor team is made up of surgical, medical, dental, and nutrition students. They helped perform 26 facial surgeries and saw nearly 23,000 medical patients as well as 13,000 dental patients. When you hear about the Mayan civilization, you probably think about ancient temples in Central America, but the Mayan culture is very much alive and well to this very day. One ISU student was able to reach out to the world in a very unique way. He was able to speak with Mayan elders who were gathered at the UN headquarters. It was the first time the Maya were invited to address the United Nations. And joining us today is Giaco Bazi Yanez, an anthropology student at ISU. Jocko, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. There's a lot of people out there who think of the Mayans very similarly to the Aztecs as only an ancient culture. But one of the things the Mayan elders really wanted to emphasize is they're still here. Tell me a little bit about what they had to say. Um, well, that, that's true. And uh, according to the president of the Mayan National Council, um, one thing that he did want to make clear is that we are very present. Mm -hmm. and. Um, from the Mayan perspective, uh, over the history, they've they've encountered so much prosecution, um, oppression, manipulation, mm -hmm. and even though that their numbers have dwindled uh, according to history, um, they they are still very much thriving. Mm -hmm. And um, for the president to come to the United Nations was a was a big step to come forward to be on that stage and to speak on behalf of the Maya and to. Uh, engage with a dialogue with uh, U.S. authorities and um, individuals who are willing to engage in that dialogue. Now the Maya are, they're no longer a country per se. Where are they located? Um, well the Maya span um, from many regions uh, in Latin America, uh, southern Mexico mm -hmm. all the way through the Yucatan Peninsula um, and then we go into Central America where we have Guatemala uh, Honduras, El Salvador, Belize, and um, together uh, the Maya culture uh, exists throughout that entire region and um, in fact the president of the Mayan, Mayan National Council, he presides over all those countries. So uh, whereas our president um, 
presides over our country and represents our country, this individual um, has authority and speaks on behalf of all the Mayan of, of those countries. I would think that would be a lot to keep track of. Now, one of the primary reasons that the Mayan elders wanted to go to the UN was to clear up some misconceptions that people have about their prophecies and about their calendars. We hear a lot about the world ending in 2012 according to Mayan calendars. And that's not correct, is it? Right, and you know, that was the main reason why I push forward to make this trip possible mm -hmm. and uh, because I really wanted to see for myself and hear for myself and uh, and the Mayan president uh, really came out and addressed the audience that you know what has been heard what the popular culture knows of this 2012 date is false information and mm -hmm. in fact incorrect uh, according to the Maya people um, they're ending a long count calendar, which is a period of 5,200 years. Mm -hmm. And this ending of a calendar, um, we're approaching um, at the date of 2000, uh, 2012, December 12th, and, or excuse me, December 21st. And um, th he really wanted to make clear that um, the world is not going to end. And this information did, didn't come from the Maya. It came from other individuals who've been able to monopolize off the opportunity of uh, major films, books, and um, just the the attention that it draws. Mm -hmm. And um, that was one thing that these elders wanted to come forward and say was that this is not true and you're hearing it directly from us. Okay. Thank you so much for coming and talking about your trip. Um, what a wonderful experience. Thank, Thank you, you so much for joining us. Thank you. And in addition to his trip to the UN, Giacco Bazzi has been working with ISU's Dr. Richard Hansen, excavating ancient Mayan temples in the jungles of Guatemala. Next, we will introduce you to a man that is an archaeologist by trade, but a giver by heart. This man has taken on a huge archaeological dig in the jungles of Central America, but he's also reaching past the antiquities he's uncovering to make environmental and social changes impacting modern-day citizens. Elaine Washam introduced us to one ISU scientist who is literally changing the landscape of Guatemala in every way possible. It's overwhelming to think about. He is up against such odds and it is such an important project for not just Guatemala, the country, but for the world, really. Julie Hillebrand had the opportunity to film, photograph, and report what ISU senior scientist Richard Hansen is doing in the Miradora Basin in Guatemala. He's uncovering ancient Mayan ruins, which for centuries people thought were hills, as seen in this photograph. She experienced only a sliver of the work the archaeologist is doing to help this area become more economically stable. The story, almost out of a movie, starts in a remote small town. He grew up here in the farmlands of Rupert, Idaho, but now he spends at least six months out of the year in the jungles of Guatemala. Hansen was first introduced to the Miradora Basin through an excavation Brigham Young University was doing while he was in school. During one of his first ventures into a temple, he made a discovery that would change the face of the Mayan timeline. And as I came down on the floors of that building, up on the upper floors, I found the pre-classic pottery still in place on the floors of the building. And I, I realized right at that moment that the whole model was wrong. He then understood he would spend the next 20 years convincing colleagues this new timeline was correct. The, the discovery that Maya society was so sophisticated a thousand years earlier than what we thought was a major upheaval in the profession. Due to his knowledge of architecture and the area, he was later invited by the Guatemalan government to research the basin as a whole. And the idea was on a regional perspective, was using the same scholars for the lithics, for the, for the ceramics, for the shell, for the pollen, for the soils, we got a much better perspective of what was going on. He now has worked on mapping 51 of these ruins and worked extensively on 26 of them. His interest in the past culture lies in how a state-level society managed to rise in an area with nothing comparable in complexity. But Hansen's work doesn't stop with archaeology. He has adopted the area not only in the past context, but in the present. His goal is to change the surrounding area's culture 
from one of exploitation to conservation. And these individuals had re reviewed the ruins as a resource. They're simply to be exploited. They were ripping into, into pyramids, ripping out ceramics, ripping through art, and ripping out and finding whatever they could, like jade and shell, to sell. He believes not only education, but offering an economic alternative to the locals will create a solution to save the ruins and the surrounding rainforest. By teaching locals how to speak English and about the history of their land, he is slowly creating a team of tourist guides. He shows the locals that tourism gives them a more long-term profit compared to looting or logging. It's been a, it's been a marvelous thing to, to observe as these people make that transition from a poacher and a looter uh, to a caretaker and a conservationist. So far, Hansen and his team have trained 28 guides. With the help of the AOK Foundation in Idaho Falls, he has also placed 72 computers in the villages that surround the basin. They know they have the intelligence. They just don't have the opportunity. They never had the chance to learn. And all of a sudden, the, the whole world opens up to them in a whole new, a whole new dimension. They become members of the world. They become members of, the hum, of, of humanity, uh, rather than an isolated little chiclero out in the jungle. He is also working to save what is left of the rainforest around the ruins by making it a roadless wilderness area, much like the national parks in the U.S. But somebody had the vision of what Yellowstone would mean for this country and for the world, for that matter. We're in exactly the same position here. In the midst of all these pursuits, for the last five years, he has involved students in the work. Not only do the students gain experience in their field of study, but they also experience the act of service. And that's kind of a, a satisfying experience for a student to realize that they make a difference. After 30 years of research, his project is still ongoing. He has one underlying message from all his experience. If you've got better people, you've got better families. If you have better families, you have better societies. If you have better societies, you have better nations. And if you have better nations, you have a better world. From Rupert, Idaho. Elaine Washam, Idaho State of Mind. Some well-known Hollywood stars have invested millions of dollars into Hansen's project, sparking interest from foundations like the Global Heritage Fund and many major industries in Guatemala. As the state-designated provider of health professions education, Idaho State University brings us Healthy State of Mind, a segment dedicated to all things health-related. First, we look at cancer and ISU's fight against it. Patrick Swayze, Luciana Pavarotti, Joan Crawford each died from pancreatic cancer. It's one of the more deadly forms of cancer. Idaho State University School of Pharmacy is testing a new chemical compound that has shown to be effective in treating cancer cells. Well, pancreatic cancer is a cancer which uh, has very poor survival rate. rate. Only about 4 to 6 percent of the patients who get the disease survive after five years and there's a lot of challenge to uh, find new drugs for treating some of these cancers like pancreatic cancer. Preliminary testing of the compound has been successful in blocking cancer cells with low toxicity levels. Researchers are studying how the drug works at the molecular level. Clinical trials still need to be completed before the compound can be approved by the FDA. The health concerns of one family member can have a profound effect on the entire family. Idaho State of Mind's Katie Ziggers introduces us to ISU volleyball player Jenica Wright. She shows us how a younger brother's health problems change their family dynamics forever, yet bringing them closer in the process. Being close to her family was an important part of Jennifer Wright's choice to play volleyball at Idaho State. The 5'10 outside hitter who hails from St. George, Utah, a seven-hour drive from Pocatello, seems short when she's close enough to visit her brother Tanner, who was born with complications 16 years ago. Tanner was born deaf and like blind, and he had a hole in his heart, so he has many troubles. So we all the family learned to sign when we were all little kids. So we're all good at it. My whole family signs. It's fun. But yeah, me and Tanner are like best friends. Just growing up together. Jenica and Tanner are extremely close, but they give each other a hard time too. He has hearing aids so he can hear good. He'll take him out sometimes be like, I can't hear you, what are you saying? Or if we sign to him, he'll be like, I can't hear you and I'm all I'm signing to you. You can hear me. Jenica understands the family dynamic isn't typical, but the Wright siblings enjoy their ability to communicate just within their own family. 
I tell them just to sign and people will watch us and it's like really cool and we're just like snow talking, just signing and so we're a different family. We do it in church a lot, like all the time we just sign if we're bored. With all of Tanner's health issues, he wasn't supposed to live yeah. past his second birthday. But today he's driving is a huge motivation factor. Now that he's 16, he's like a miracle and yeah, I, he's like amazing. So he pushes me a lot when I see him up there cheering. He counts down the days, like 16 more days I see you play. He always asks me our practices every day. He's so funny, he'll write down the score and he'll get mad if we lose. He gets so mad if we lose. He'll text and be like, you lost today. And like, he's way into my sports. He's like my biggest fan. From Reed Gym, Katie Ziggers, Idaho State of Mind. Idaho State of Mind, we will look at why Idaho teens aren't going on. You've probably seen the ads urging high school students to pursue a higher education. We will look at why Idaho ranks near the bottom of the barrel when it comes to students furthering their education. We'll also take a comprehensive look at what you need to know if you want to get into college. Whether you're 18 or 80, this is one you won't want to miss. And that's all for this episode of Idaho State of Mind. Thank you for joining us from the campus of Idaho State University. I'm Libby Howe. We'll see you next time.